Welcome to this episode of Let's Be Civil. Today, my guest on Let's Be Civil is Lisa Powell. Lisa Powell is the founder, principal, engineer, president, and majority owner of PE Structural Consultants Incorporated. She's a structural engineer who focuses on the design of bridges and buildings. Previously, she worked for an international bridge firm as well as TxDOT, leading to over 30 years of experience in research, development, and design of structures. In 2010, she was elected to the University of Texas at Austin Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering Academy of Distinguished Alumni. All right, thank you everybody uh, for joining us again on the Let's Be Civil podcast. And uh, today I'm gonna tell you that uh, the dogs are already barking um, uh, at at my home office. And so uh, we might get serenaded a little bit this morning, but if that happens, uh, um, we'll just see how bad it is. We may do a little stop and, and restart, but um, I've got Lisa with me today uh, and um, I'm going to let her do a little self-introduction and, and we'll be off and running uh, just talking about life as an engineer. All right. So, well, so go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, thank you, John. Uh, So my full name that I use professionally is Lisa Carter Powell, comma PE. So I grew up Lisa Carter on the East Coast as an only child following my daddy around uh, who um, actually never went to college but learned um, through various channels uh, the art of engineering and he, uh, he worked for a big steel company on the East Coast and actually had a full squad of engineers uh, that he oversaw. Um, but, you know, he would mix up concrete and do projects and I'd be right there, you know, making stuff out of concrete <laughs> or wood or whatever he had around. Um, so went through high school, pretty good math and sciences, thought about being an engineer and uh, looked at the various kinds of of engineering. Wasn't real interested in electrons floating around and double E, even though the double E's were making lots of money. Uh, But I was really attracted to civil engineering because it's such a broad field. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can do everything from structures and land planning and um, water, wastewater, environmental, all sorts of things. I had a real interest in in building things because my dad always built stuff sure, and sure. Um, and and the thing about the other thing about civil engineering, you know, it's it's big stuff. It's buildings. It's bridges. It's things people use every day. Uh, so that had a lot of appeal to me. So I started looking around um, at different programs um, around mostly on the East Coast. And, and I found very quickly that the ones in the Northeast were very expensive, <laughs> so <laughs> like Cornell and MIT. <laughs> so I, I started hearing about a, a co-op programs, which mm-hmm. I thought was a great idea um, because I'm independent and wanted to put myself through school. Uh, and so I um, looked at Virginia Tech and Georgia Tech and University of Florida and Gainesville. And I picked Georgia Tech because Virginia Tech's kind of a cow town. (laughs) There's not much there in Blacksburg, Virginia. And I had heard that um, that the Gators and University of Florida were was a real party school, and I felt like I was I was more serious than that. But um, but Georgia Tech was right smack dab in the middle of downtown Atlanta. So. That sounded like a good place to go. <laughs> so I went there and I loved it for, and spent my first uh, full um, three quarters, they had the quarter system on campus mm-hmm. and then started my co-op career, uh, which was great. I worked um, 
uh, actually for a power company, Duke Power Company yeah. in North and South Carolina. So my first three quarters uh, on the job were at a nuclear power plant, which uh, sounds sort of exotic, I guess, but was such a cool place to learn because you talk about big stuff. I mean, you know, they have number 18 rebars that they're CAD welding and containment vessels that are, you know, the steel is six inches thick and right, right. slabs five foot thick. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of a different world. Right. So, um, and, it, and it was a great experience because I was learning on the job and I actually learned how to do concrete design um, on the job before I ever had the class. And mm -hmm. so when I went back to the class, it's like, oh yeah, this really makes sense because I've been doing this. <laughs> Uh, so it was a great experience, but, um, and, you know, I imagined myself, uh, you know, as a senior at Georgia Tech, what, what was coming next. And as a, as a female engineer, that was kind of, uh, an interesting position to be in because I had, I had one, uh, female professor in the technical part at Georgia Tech mm -hmm. and that was, that was it. And that was physics. Um, so I didn't have, there was no faculty okay. that were, that were women. Um, and so, you know, I kind of got the idea that I wanted to go on to graduate school and get a master's and a PhD and become, uh, sure. a professor sure. just to kind of fill that need. Yep. Yep. So I started looking at graduate programs. And at that point, I, I realized my affinity for structural engineering. So I took all those structures related courses that, sure. that I could at, um, at Georgia Tech and uh, actually imagined myself, you know, maybe working on some big high rise buildings and that sort of thing. Um, but, um, but then thinking more on the academic side, really just wanted to continue that learning. Because the, I mean, the field of uh, eng uh, civil engineering is so broad that the curriculum is broad. So that you basically, if you're going to specialize in any one of those areas, you, you just get a taste, you know, yeah, by the time yeah, you're, yeah. you finish your undergraduate career. So, um, so I wanted to get a master's in structures. And, um, and again, search for schools, narrowed it down, Stanford, um, Berkeley. And um, at, at that point, I was just looking at Stanford and Berkeley and I, I actually had a full scholarship to Stanford. Uh, and I went out there and that's yeah, gorgeous, like a country club that, mm -hmm. I don't know, I just didn't get warm fuzzies. Right. And I, I came, came back to my Georgia Tech mentor and you know, kind of having a mental breakdown. What am I right, going right, to do now? Right, right, <laughs> I don't right. want to go to California. Right. And so, you know, he said, do you ever think about Texas? And I actually grew up on the East Coast. You know, I'd been to California, but I never actually, well, actually the first time I went to California was the first time I crossed the Mississippi. Mm. So I had never been to Texas ever. And, um, but they started talking about the University of Texas and about right. the, laboratory and about uh, actually had a couple of professors at georgia tech who'd gotten their phds here in texas um and so it was kind of it was kind of late in the game but did a rush rush and you know got applications in and um and got a fellowship at um at ut and worked in the ferguson lab yeah yeah and um and that's actually where i i got sort of pushed into the to the transportation realm because I, I was working on a project that had to do with bridges. Because up up until that point I really didn't I didn't really know a whole lot about bridges and right, transportation right. structures um, and ended up on a research project with some really exciting stuff. Um, and interestingly when I was in graduate school, so I I guess I started in the seventh grade with um taking french classes oh really and uh and i continue all through high school and then i actually in college it was just a fun elective to do so i continued french all the way through undergraduate and i got put on this uh project 
at UT that had to do with external post tensioning for bridges, right. which was a concept that had actually been developed in France right. um, as a way to evade the patents of Eugene Fresnay, who is he's kind of thought of as the father of pre-stressing or father of pre-stressed concrete. And so people were trying to get around his patents because he, he owned a lot of patents right. on that. And, um, and so they came up with this, this method of external post-tensioning where the tendons are not actually inside the concrete, mm -hmm. you know, they mm -hmm. run external to the mm -hmm. section and mm -hmm. are held down at discrete points. Uh, but the interesting thing about that, that all the development at that point, all the technical literature that existed in the world at that time, 95% um, of it was in French. Nine months in English, there's about 5% in, in German. So, no sprechen Sie Deutsch. But I, I do, I, I did speak French. I mean, I oh. just come from uh, a European trip, you know, the, the uh, traditional Eurail backpack thing through, through Europe and spent a lot of time in France and Switzerland and, and um, was fairly fluent, could read. I mean, been, reading college level French literature for, you know, for years. Wow. So, um, so I never thought in a million years that I would use my French <laughs> to, for my civil engineering. Right, right, but I right. did so, and, you know, made contacts with all sorts of uh, engineers uh, over in France and, um, and did in the course of my research and published things that uh, for the first time in English that had never been published mm -hmm. uh, that, that was in French. So there well, we go. Well, I'll and tell you. Came out of that program and, uh, and started working as a bridge engineer and, and have been ever since. So. How long would that be? Well, Date yourself. that is actually about... <laughs> um, 33 wow. some odd years uh, wow. if you count everything so um i have really enjoyed it i've also worked on i've done a lot of things building projects and 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 mm -hmm. different things mm -hmm. not just not just bridge work but mm -hmm. my love is really for for bridges and concrete and um so uh i actually met my husband at, in the lab at the University of Texas okay. um, in the Phil Ferguson lab. And uh, he's also a structural engineer and with a master's degree from, from UT. Um, uh, I guess towards the end of my master's, it, it ran a little long for, for several different reasons. And by the time I finished my master's, I thought, okay, well, <laughs> probably not gonna do that PhD, but been having fun doing this for, for so long. Yeah, sure. uh, we started, um, well, I, I worked first for an international bridge company. Um, students that follow the news will know who FIG Engineering is right, because yeah. that was the FIU yeah. collapse. I actually had worked closely with the with the engineer of record on that uh, mm. at FIG, um, and then uh, and then went to work for TechDot. So I worked for TechDot for right. about five years, right. and then. Um, my husband and I founded our firm, so PE Structural Consultants. So that was in uh, 1992. So we've mm -hmm. had the firm for going on 28 years in wow. October. Impressive. So, Impressive. Um, done a variety of projects and mostly mostly public work. So right. if you know if you're in Austin, Texas, you know we did the bridge at the airport. We did. Uh, the City Hall, the new Central Library, the Austin Center for the um, for the Homeless, the Arch Building, um, lots of you know, 183A uh, and SH130, and uh, we do we do bridge work all over the all over the state. So, so I now have about uh, uh, five or six podcasts worth of of content to, to talk with you about <laughs> um, so we can we can we can start chipping away um, but I'm gonna go all the way to back to the to the start so uh, uh, East Coast um, so you said your dad worked for a steel company so what what, what was the steel company Bethlehem Steel okay. which doesn't exist anymore 
yep. I bought by the Chinese. <laughs> yeah. So I, I figured that that's what you were going to say. My um, wife was actually born and raised in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Oh, um, really? And uh, her father worked for Bethlehem Steel, uh, you know, part of part of the uh, uh, manufacturing side of things. He's not an engineer. Um, and uh, I went to Lehigh for my ah, master's. Ah, okay, yeah. So, so when you said you know East Coast and in and and a steel firm, I figured that's the was the case. Um, they had uh, uh, a large tower uh, that was uh, you know the uh, headquarters for Bethlehem Steel, and when when they no longer existed, uh, they were looking to do something with the tower, and. Um, uh, if I remember things correctly, there was asbestos in the building, but it was built at a time when, you know, before yeah. anybody knew anything, 18 stories or something like that. And so it, it was not uh, financially feasible to, to remove it, to repurpose the building. And then there were issues with, well, tearing it down, then you've got, you know, exposure and stuff like that. But they ultimately imploded the building. And uh, my wife said it's a it's a struggle for her to fly in there. Uh, her sister still lives there, and to no longer see the the landmark uh, yeah. because it was the tallest building, you know, in in the area there. And so now it's not there. It, I mean, it's not that it's the same thing as uh, as nine eleven, but it, from the from the emotional response perspective of things, for her to to not see this. You know, essentially, the 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 reason that Bethlehem exists is the steel company, and and uh, you know, and that icon is no longer there. So, um, so that you, know, I, I I figured that that's. And then when you said things like Cornell and stuff like that, you know, I was like, okay, so so that's where <laughs> that's probably the case. Um, so so bridges is an area that's uh, of interest to me as well. Uh, I did do the, all the way, you know, through the the PhD program, um, uh, and did my dissertation on, you know, this will date me. Besides the the gray hair, um, it, it was looking at the impact of high strength concrete on highway bridge design, and you know, today, you know. It's like with a lot of things, you're going to go, well, you know, high strength concrete, big deal. You know, we we do this all the time. It's kind of become more the norm than the oddity. But at one point in time, you know, doing something in 10,000 PSI concrete was a special set yeah. of circumstances. It wasn't the norm. And um, so my dissertation was looking at how would we redesign standard ashto, bulb tees, box sections, or whatever, if we knew we could generate, you know, uh, uh, routinely a 10,000 psi mix uh, and had high, you know, high uh, 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 tension steel, uh, you know, high strength strands, uh, and and actually use six tenths inch uh, strands. And so, what would we, what could we do in terms of uh, uh, reconfiguration of not just the cross section, but the placement of the steel and and, and such? And so um, that was a you know a, a lot of parametric study. Uh, but this will be now for all you kids out there. One of those kind of statements. Um, I actually had to write uh, a a basic language series of software programs to do bridge design so that I could do the parametric study because there's no way you were going to by hand right. tweak, tweak something and then run through a whole series of computations. So I had to, had to write uh, software, my own software to, to do the bridge design stuff. I actually have the five and a quarter inch. Was it five and a quarter? Yeah, because it was three and a half. So I, uh, I still own the five, floppy. yep, the <laughs> floppy disks that have the basic software uh, programs on them to, to do all of the work that we did. So uh, uh, it was fun. I mean, that, you know, when you talk about you kind of got into something, Bridges interest to me, but the more I did, and I've been, and I, you know, not that this is about me, but self-taught uh, because, 
you know, I had no background uh, previously into getting involved in this research project. And so I had to teach myself bridge design, teach myself pre-stress concrete design, and then put them together to, to, to do the, the dissertation work. So it was, uh, it was fascinating uh, to go through all of that process. So um, the, you know, the, another element here, and I, and I actually would like to, to follow up on this one, uh, uh, maybe more than, than other things, as you mentioned that there were no other, there was no female uh, faculty. Um, and, and I recognize that as an, as an issue on, on a lot of campuses. I think most people do, is the lack of uh, sufficient role models. Uh, when you were at Georgia Tech, so it was all, all men, at Georgia Tech at the time. Yeah, in my, all my in your, in your, engineering in your, in your, classes right, were all, right. yeah. How many other women were in classes with you at that time? Well, you know, Georgia Tech is, is almost all engineering. I right. mean, there's, there's a small business school and there's some natural sciences, but for the large part, it's all engineering. And when I, um, when I started, so, this dates me yeah. in 1979. Yeah. Um, I, there was one woman for every 10 men at Georgia Tech. Okay. But by the time I finished my five year co op program in 1984, it was one to five. So, um, you know, it's changing, changing very rapidly. Right, and right. now when I, when I work with the students at uh, UT campuses, the other, other campuses, I mean, it's getting pretty close to 50 50 uh, so that's really that's really exciting yeah, um, yeah. you know there aren't um, I, I, our, our firm is pretty unique uh, because right now we have um, we have about uh, we have 21 folks and we have um, uh, a dozen licensed engineers and and then EITs and CAD. Um, my two vice, I have three vice presidents, two of whom are, are women. Uh, our firm is actually about 65% female. Mm. And I mean, we only have one admin, but then uh, three CAD techs and the rest are engineers. Right. And um, we have a lot of women. Um, which, uh, you know, I don't know it's, if it's the fact that the leadership is, is more female, so that mm -hmm. attracts it draws, yeah, more yeah, women yeah, um, yeah. into the firm. But I think it's probably an anomaly for an engineering firm to be, uh, to be so heavily female. Mm -hmm. but, um, but at the same time, you know, if you go out and give a paper at ACI or, you know, one of the technical organizations and you look out at your peers it's it's still yeah. you're still the minority yeah um, but but you're right but it's it is changing. it's going yes it's changing. It, yeah 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 uh, and the more the more women that that are in the leadership positions and the project managers and the and principal engineers uh, you know i think that it, it attracts more of the younger younger women and mm -hmm. they look and see oh well if she's doing that i can right. i can do that too right so. right well, now the, the, the classic uh, 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 comment that, that young ladies will make about ch not choosing engineering is um, either that they didn't feel they were strong math and science or strong enough math and science. That, that, that's historically, I'll say, is, is something that we would hear a lot. And, and I think the other would be that there's, there's uh, no role models. And, and, you know, I mean, you go back to when I was a, an undergraduate student, there were very, very few females within any class that I took. I mean, you know, it was one or two, if there were any. Um, today, you know, when I have classes where uh, close to 20 to 25 percent of the population of the students in the classroom are or, or young uh, women, which is a huge improvement uh, and, and a very positive one. But for you, did you feel any of this kind of, you know, maybe I shouldn't do this because 
you know, there isn't anybody else like me in the classroom or do I really feel strong in my, in my academics to, to succeed? Um, and actually it'd be interesting. Did you ever have anybody suggest to you that you were, you know, pursuing the wrong career path? From, from, you know, you know I, th I think that I've been lucky. I mean, my, I was, I guess I was only child. And of course, you know, my parents thought I was the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> and so, you know, whatever, whatever I set my mind to, I mean, they were always, you know, 120% behind me. Right, so I right. never had any, any issues about that. They were always very, um, very encouraging. And what about um, in high school, though? I mean, so in high school did people encourage you or and i don't want to say discouraged you um but maybe not encouraged you to pursue something like an engineering uh, well, actually in high school is when i first started well i took drafting i think i was the maybe i think i probably was the only girl <laughs> in the drafting class <laughs> um but um uh, no, I mean, I, I went to a fairly large high school in kind of, kind of rural Maryland, but we had like 600 kids, so that was pretty big for back then. Right. And, um, you know, we had a pretty strong, I mean, I, you know, I excelled in all my maths and scientists, uh, science courses, and and my professors were, uh, well, not professors, my teachers back yes. then were always very encouraging, and, uh, you know, I, I, I feel, you know, I, on one hand, I didn't, I didn't have many role models that were female, mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. you know, I had lots of great role models and mentors that, um, that were male. And I mean, regardless of your gender, you know, mm -hmm. there's positive traits that, you know, you look up to and you want to emulate. Sure. Um, so, uh, yeah, I never, I have had a few things along the way. I had, you know, as private developers sitting in, my conference room and uh, you know working on on a project mostly with my husband that he was working on and and you know I was sitting right there at the All conference right. room table um, and you know and he kind of goes on about how he would never get a woman to you know do design work for him that was just beyond his wildest imagination <laughs> Well, right, um, right, but you know, right, I've learned right. to keep my mouth shut and <laughs> to smile on through those things. But uh, for me personally, um, the fact that I was one of few was actually a positive thing because when there aren't many like you, um, you tend to stand out in a crowd mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. people remember you mm -hmm. and um, you don't get, you know, get lost in a of faces you know, mm -hmm. on the other side you, you're in a room with a whole bunch of guys it's kind of it's kind of hard to remember you know <laughs> one in particular right um, yep, yep. if you're the only woman then they're yep, certainly they're gonna, all yep. going to remember you yeah um, yep. so I've always seen it as an opportunity uh, rather than a hindrance sure, sure. I won't say that it's you know it's always easy I think that you have to um, uh, um uh, you certainly have to work a little harder and and be on your toes uh, just because of the fact that you're different and you're right, standing right, out in the crowd right, right um right. but i've never i've never seen it um uh as a as a really huge hindrance really more as an opportunity and i've never had people to help except for that private developer that, right right you know he, he actually passed away with a heart attack about a year later uh, mm. after that. And I think had something to do with his angst about, about several things. Mm. But, um, um, but fortunately, you know, most people are pretty open-minded. Yeah, say. yeah. When, um, when you were uh, now at college, whether, whether undergrad or grad level, did you get involved much in student organizations? Oh yeah, I did. I was in Chi Epsilon, which is the civil engineering. I was in Tau Beta Pi. I've got my got my you bench got over there that okay. I right. <laughs> that yeah. I polished. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And I was uh, I was very very active on campus. Um, I was I was actually a TA in English mm. at, at Georgia Tech. 
um, and uh, I actually had all the all the athletes in oh, okay. classes okay. with all the athletes, which was hilarious because um, their writing was very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but that was uh, I actually have a have a uh, kind of a minor in technical communication. Oh, which okay. I think has been very helpful. Uh, you know, because they always make the jokes about engineers that they can't spell and they can't write. But I think it's one of the most important skills that you can have as an engineer is mm -hmm. the ability to write and to, to speak. Um, and uh, I was I also worked for the, the campus caterer, which uh, oh, really which sounds sort of kind of, you know, just grunt work. But I, the campus caterer you know, did all the parties up in the boxes in the in the football games oh, and right, all the right. the um, all the fancy parties for the president of the university and all the faculty and stuff. And so I actually got to hobnob with um, a lot of people as mm. as a as a caterer. So uh, it was pretty interesting. Um, I was uh, I also was uh, the first female bodybuilding champion at oh, Georgia wow. Tech. Oh, <laughs> wow. Are you going to show us so, your guns? <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have those guns anymore. <laughs> but I had them at one time. I've got the pictures to prove it. But I was, uh, yeah, so they had the, the Mr. Georgia Tech contest every year. Um, and so there had never been any women in it. So um, I was a member of the Barbell Club, which you got to have access to a weight room it was on my side of the campus 24-7. Uh, um, and I said, well, why aren't there any women in this competition? So I was the first female bodybuilding champion. Of, well, geez, uh, now you've just added another layer of future <laughs> conversations so, to, to all of this. So um, we're, we're, it, it surprises me how quickly these conversations oh, go. Cause we're, we're, but so I'm, I'm going to, I got to throw in a little, little something since you brought that up and we'll, we will have to have some more conversations because there was, I mean, I, I, I like to focus on the conversation and, and, and not be jotting notes, but I probably have a full page of, of <laughs> notes from, from talk with you of stuff that I would want to go back and, and touch on. But, um, uh, Back in the fall, I decided that I needed to start changing some lifestyle stuff for myself. And, and so I always played sports for fun, not, not, I, I, I was not competitive sports player. Uh, you know, um, I wanted to just enjoy the camaraderie and, and, and doing things. Uh, came from a family or come from a family of 10. So, you know, we, wow. could, we could compete against each other and, you know, play in the backyard and, and, and do a lot of things. So never, I mean, we ran around so much that, you know, physically didn't, didn't need to do anything else. Um, but I'm, I'm 60 uh, and my body is showing that I'm 60. And so I decided I was going to start working out, um, which I'd, I've never had an intentional workout you know, uh, process or, you know, anything. It was just all just going out and playing golf or, you know, in the yard with the kids and stuff like that. So I started lifting and, and um, I got up early and, and lifted. Um, now the, the uh, facility literally across the street from my home in our, in our subdivision, we actually have a fitness center as a part of the subdivision uh, is closed. So I can't, I can't yeah. get in there to, to use it. Um, but you know, I was actually, you know, developing some muscles and now it's turned into flab. Um, uh, hopefully, you know, it'll reopen again. I can get back after it. Um, but I would kid around with the students, uh, uh, you know, you know, so I, one of the, one of the athletes would walk in with a, you know, tight, uh, you know, uh, under armor shirt or something like that and the muscles bulging and I just go, you know, like a you know, 60 year old guy right there, you know, kind of a thing. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting and, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you comment on this and then we'll have to wrap things up, but I consider myself pretty disciplined, but doing the exercise, you know, doing the lifting and stuff every day, because I did six, basically six days a week, I would go lift for a minimum of an hour. Um, 
and so there's there's a lot in terms of you know if, if you're disciplined in that, in one area it kind of carries over into another so you're talking about a lot of things here you know that that you were involved in so um, I'm assuming then that's kind of contributed to your not just personal but probably professional discipline in 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 how you go about your day yeah I, th I think so yeah I mean when I um, when I was bodybuilding, uh, uh, I mean, there's a whole bunch of research that goes on with that because it's, it's, I mean, it's a lot about the lifting, but it's a huge part of diet yeah. and how the diet. That one I cannot, that, that I'm not, I've not been able to, to do you, that part. <laughs> yeah. But how you cut down for competition. And mm -hmm. I mean, I just voraciously read about all sorts of things and, and, uh, and Georgia Tech actually had this great athletic complex with one of those big, uh, those tanks where they did the oh, submersion fat right, testing. Right. And I got my fat content down to like 9%, which wow. is amazing for a woman. And, um, but it was all a learning process. And, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, you get into something like that. I mean, you have to design your workouts, you, you know, you have to, to vary and, you know, do back and shoulders one day and arms and legs the next mm -hmm, day mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. and then to cut down for competition you know it's a whole process that takes months and uh so it it is a lot of discipline and yeah. you know no chocolate ice cream cone from the varsity right. across the street right, right. any of that stuff but yep, um yep. but it paid off i actually was in a, a calendar the women of georgia tech um, and uh, there was a shot where I, they, they, I was lifting a dumbbell, you know, showing off my gams. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. um, and I actually gave the calendar to the president of Georgia Tech and I autographed it for him. Um, uh, because I had met him uh, as a campus caterer, of right. course. Oh, right, right. And, yeah, uh, yeah. and also, you know, got to be uh, a good acquaintance of of, uh, it was Dr. Pettit, who was the president of the uh, university, and uh, he actually wrote my recommendation letter for Stanford, which is probably why I got a full scholarship. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, but he had he had the Georgia Tech women of Georgia Tech calendar in his executive bathroom. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> what See, can I say? You never know what right. kind of connections you're going to yep. make through what skill or uh, personality trait that you have that. Yep can lead to uh, kind of exciting things in the future. Yeah, yeah. Well, and as we were talking, you know, before we actually started the, uh, the podcast, that, that this is a lot about the people side of what we do and, and not so much about the, the technical side, because you can find that, that information in, in a lot of places, but the people side. And, you know, hearing these stories, uh, and, and, and I'll wrap up here real quick. I've got two sons. And and um, and in, in very diverse uh, professional fields, but one of the things that that I've always commented to them, and they are now uh, you know uh, thirty and twenty five, and they're they're they are saying back to me you know now, what you told us when we were younger, you know, you were right. Uh, I always tell them I'm not wrong. You know, anyway, you know, they're just now realizing it. Uh, but you really have to be careful about turning down opportunities yeah. because you never know where that might lead. And so you didn't have to do the bodybuilding thing, but look at the, as you were just saying to me, the sequence of events that, you know, even if not everything was in the behind the scenes in the way that that you believe it might have been um, something happened. There were there were things that happened for you because of one one thing led to another, you know, uh, and, and so th that's a big part that of this is that I, I think I would say to some you know anybody listening is don't don't shut yourself off from from possibilities. Uh, you, you should at least you know like you said you did some research. You yeah. know, on some of this stuff before you got into it, um, do that. Do that research and and look into things because 
you don't know where it will take you and it might take you to some of the greatest things that you could have never foreseen or imagined for yourself. So, yeah. um, so that's great. Uh, I'm honest with you when I say I've got a lot of lot more things I want to talk to you about. So, so watch for some emails is it coming down the line of, hey, let's get back on. Because uh, I'll tell you one right up uh, off the top is you started your own business. Yeah. You know, so it'd be great with, to hear. With this much business training, yeah. you know, yeah. I've so, got lots of training as a, as a structural engineer, but everything I learned about business was from the bootstraps and doing yep. it. Yep. So I think it'd be a great place to start uh, another conversation with you sometime uh, in the future. So, well, I, I hope you have a great day. I'm thrilled to have had you on the, the Let's Be Civil podcast. And I'm really looking forward to talking to you again. Me too. And I'm, I'm excited to check out the podcast and see what other people have to yeah, say. Yeah, 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 yep. Yeah. And, and we'll have to have you come to campus and Oh, I absolutely love that. Too, yeah. So, so In fact, so I have three children. My oldest is a, is a woman, young woman, and she actually went up to Rhode Island School of Design to get a BFA. And my middle son actually went up to Rhode Island to Johnson & Wales to get a Bachelor of Culinary Arts. Um, but So he's a chef, but he's also a master bicycle mechanic. Mm. But the youngest one is... Um, loves to design build uh he's in he's a junior at westwood and is already in his third architecture class and fourth engineering class because he started in middle school which is amazing and mm, yeah, engineering middle yeah. school and i was going to school uh and he's actually looking around at programs and actually very interested in texas state so nice. excellent he may be coming your way so we'll see. Well, we've he's got some of, unique stuff. He's going kind of on, uh, so. tossing the mechanical versus the, the civil side. Uh, I'll sway. I lose him to the Emmys. No, no, no. You no. never know. All right. Well, you have a good day, and I uh, really enjoyed uh, talking with you today. I did too, John. Okay. You have we'll, a great yeah, day. We'll Stay see safe you. out there. Yeah. Yep, you too. Bye. All right. Bye bye.